We've been in, engaged in a long-term project, about 25 years now, trying to understand the ecological interactions that underlie Lyme disease, variable Lyme disease risk, because we know that the risk of Lyme disease is not constant, either in space or in time. There are hot spots and cold spots. There are really bad years and not so bad years. Um, and we've been trying to understand why, what, what drives that vari variability. And a lot of it has to do, interestingly enough, with the white-footed mouse. This mouse is a very widespread organism in forests of the eastern half of North America. It turns out that they are a really good quality host for the black-legged tick, which is the vector of Lyme disease, as well as other tick-borne pathogens. And what I mean by that is that ticks that feed on a mouse have a very high probability of surviving. Whereas if they feed on some other host, they often get groomed off and killed in the process. Mice are not fastidious creatures. They, they just don't bother grooming very much. So the more mice there are, the better it is for tick survival, the better it is for tick population growth. The other key feature of white-footed mice is that for reasons that we're still trying to understand, they are a high-quality source of infection with the Lyme disease pathogen and other tick-borne pathogens as well. For some reason, the mice basically shrug off an infection. They don't tend to get sick. They don't tend to fight it off. So their bloodstreams are crawling with tick-borne pathogens that they're not bothering to protect themselves against immunologically. So ticks that feed on a mouse not only survive better, but they're much more likely to get infected with the things that can make us sick. So more mice means more infected ticks. So then one might ask the question, well, what determines how many mice there are out there? And it, in fact, that's the question that we've um, spent a lot of time addressing. And there are a lot of answers to it, but there are two really important ones that we've discovered. One is acorn production. The other is how many predators there are. These mice live in oak-dominated forests. They live elsewhere as well, but most of the territory in the eastern U.S. where they occur is oaky uh, forest of some kind or another. And when there's a really good acorn year, the mice survive the winter following a good acorn fall very well, and they start breeding really early. And they reach a population peak the summer following a good acorn year. This is a repeated pattern that we've um, been monitoring for 25 years, um, in, and, and other research groups have found this as well. So good acorns in the fall lead to an outbreak of mice the following summer, any ticks that are around that following summer get to feed on mice, and what we see are outbreaks of infected ticks capable of transmitting disease to us two summers after that acorn fall, and that's because of a delay in the tick life cycle. So we can predict how bad a year it's going to be almost two years in advance based on acorn production. Acorns are not the only thing that influence mice. One of the other features of mouse population abundance that's fairly well predictive is how many predators there are, particularly things like foxes and bobcats, and also we suspect raptors like owls, although we've found it much more difficult to study them. So in places where foxes are living and have a den and mothers are feeding their, their young, the infection prevalence in the ticks, so the proportion of ticks that are dangerous to us, tends to be strongly suppressed. Um, and interestingly, where there are coyotes around, coyotes evict the foxes. And so where there are coyotes, we see a higher risk of Lyme disease, higher infection in the ticks. These are complicated interactions that fall in the realm of community ecology. This is how species interactions affect phenomena that we're interested in, in this case, disease risk. Um, so we still have work to do, um, but we're starting to get a better and better predictive understanding of when and where we're most at risk. Well, humans are doing a couple of different things to influence their own risk of getting sick. When we fragment natural habitat like forest, uh, when we degrade it or chop it up into little bits, we eliminate some elements of the vertebrate community. We reduce diversity. And the species that tend to disappear tend to be the larger bodied species that are more predatory. There are others, um, things like opossums and skunks and bobcats that also sometimes eat these mice, but also attract hungry ticks away from mice. 
And the ticks that feed on those other species often either get killed or fail to get infected and therefore are not dangerous to us. The other thing we do is more of a human behavioral influence. When we start to fragment the forest to create housing developments, we then go ahead and plunk our houses down right in the hot zone, placing our families right in harm's way um, in this sort of perverse process, an unintended one, where we increase risk in the environment and then expose ourselves to that increased risk by placing our backyards uh, right next to these small and, and fragmented forested areas. We know that Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases are spreading. That's without question. Um, that's happening. It's happening in the U.S. It's happening in Canada. Very similar or the very same diseases are spreading in Europe as well. And in many cases, we don't really know why. Um, we only have a partial um, explanation as to why they're spreading. Um, a number of people have implicated climate change, and there's little doubt that climate change has the capacity to increase the geographic range, the distribution of these diseases. But we have a lot of work to do to figure out what is it about a warming climate that is increasing suitability of the habitat or abundance of these ticks. One hypothesis that's been proposed is that an important source of mortality in tick populations are cold snaps in the winter, that they're vulnerable to super cold temperatures. And we know that you can kill ticks quite easily in the lab by cooling them down. Right around freezing is, is sufficient. So maybe it's the case that super cold temperatures knocks them off and that as the climate warms, the probability of a super cold snap like that is reduced, therefore ticks can continue to move further north or further up in elevation. There is not a lot of support for that right now. The ticks seem to be able to somehow escape those super cold conditions. They live in the soil when they're not on an animal host. Um, and it looks like they can get down into soil pores. They have a chemical antifreeze in their bodies. So it's not clear to what extent cold snaps are nailing them. So that mechanism may not be as important as some people think. Another possible mechanism is that ticks lead a very slow life cycle for such a tiny creature. They, their life cycle plays itself out over about two years. And over those two years, there are three different stages that need to find an animal host on which to take a blood meal. So they spend most of their lives on the forest floor doing either nothing, sitting there in a state of suspended animation, or looking for a host. The time over which they need to find a host before something kills them, some random abiotic factor kills them, or some natural enemy kills them, may be very important. And it may be that in order to live out their life cycle in time, they need a certain level of warmth. The colder it is, the less likely it might be for them to be able to take three blood meals all within a two-year period to, f to live out their life cycle. So as the total warmth of an environment increases, they may be more likely to be able to invade. And there is some evidence for that being the case. But we have a low-tech, but I think a, a, a delightful, even elegant way of asking what kills ticks in nature. And what we can do is take a little uh, soil core. We use a machine that makes a, a hole in a golf course. Um, and that takes a plug of soil that's maybe um, 10 centimeters deep. And we can put a known number of ticks in that soil core um, and encase it in a breathable mesh fabric that keeps the ticks inside. Um, but the ticks now have the latitude to move wherever they want to move for the long period of time in which they're off a host on the ground. We can put a little data recorder in there, a little eye button that tells us exactly what the temperature, humidity, soil moisture, et cetera, are um, basically in real time. And then by removing these soil cores frequently out of the environment, we can ask what killed the ticks? What, was it winter cold? Was it summer heat? Was it spring dryness? Um, these are things we don't know yet. What kills ticks in nature? Once we know what kills them, we can then actually run population models that ask whether if that particular area warms slightly in climate, will that make it better or worse for ticks to survive? So we have a combination of low-tech field techniques and very high-tech modeling approaches 
that we think will allow us to, to understand mechanistically what it is about the climate that limits ticks and then where are they likely to move as the climate continues to warm.